Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to Mexican Excellence. Tonight, I have a very special guest who is going to be discussing many issues impacting our community. We have Dr. Gabriel Buena with us tonight. He is a Chicano Studies professor at Cal State Northridge. He's been there since 1999. He's also a lawyer and serving as vice president and trustee on the board of Los Angeles Community College District as of July 1st, 2017. Dr. Buena, welcome to Mexican Excellence. How are you this evening? Oh, happy to be here. <laughs> Did I miss anything on your bio? Anything you want to share? Well, um, well, I also have my uh, my, my YouTube channel, um, you know, uh, and um, you know, which um, Citali you were on uh, a few weeks back, and and I encourage everyone to go to on YouTube, put in Buena News, and check out the interview. And you know, part of doing this interview is saying because a lot of a lot of folks say, God, you know, uh, we never, you know, Mexicans, we never get along, and you know, and and I'm like, yeah, we do. You know, even if we disagree, you know, we we get along, we share things, we talk about things. It's it's not a problem. So you know, I think we should all kind of be on each other's shows. Um, the other thing, as an attorney, I just started. I'm going to be, you know, I think we were talking about. You know, you have a four-year-old and I have a, on the opposite end of 18, 20, and 22-year-old. So I'm shamelessly going to plug that I'm a new attorney, but I also have a, a, a little law firm in, in Los Angeles called, if you go, everyone goes to BuenaLaw.com, and I focus on family law, uh, divorce, restraining orders, uh, things like that. So I go from Chicano studies, restraining orders, divorces, to be on the trustee, on the board. Um, but, you know, there's, you know, life is interesting and you have to do a lot of different things in life. Um, in college, I used to sell to swap me, you know, to that's how I pay for graduate school, you know, so you've got to survive. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yes, that's how I was going to introduce you as well to let everyone know about your YouTube channel. You know, I don't think it's very common that someone like yourself has a YouTube channel. It's really rare that a professor, lawyer, you know, trustee member has a channel, but I think that speaks volumes of your intention as far as getting this information out there, making that accessible, transparent, policy making. There's so much I want to ask you tonight. There's kind of like a, a bio that I want to go to just so everyone know I'm going to have all of his contact information, his YouTube channel handles in the video description. So after you finish hearing us out, you can definitely see where you can contact Dr. Buena yourself. Um, I also wanted to let them know that, yes, I was invited on his channel a few weeks back to discuss why I am not a Latina. And it was a very, very, you know, exciting conversation. I, I'm really grateful that he opened that space for me because, like I said, it's such a much needed conversation that I've been having for 24 years. And the fact that, you know, Dr. Buena saw me on TikTok you know, got in contact with me, I was just like amazed. And I'm so grateful. The power of social media, I think it's really working as far as connecting folks. And like you said, Gabriel, you know, we have to support each other. We are in community. And it's like the whole stereotype of crabs in the barrel, like, unfortunately, that does happen in some cases. Mm -hmm. But I think we are showing that that's the opposite, right? And like you're saying, we're not, we don't have to agree 100% with everything, but the fact is we are each other's community and we should help be each other's support systems because it's challenging everything that we're up against, the spaces that we're doing, the policies that we're trying to change. So it is really important that we, for morality, for, for, you know, for excitement, for inspiration, that we keep each other, you know, going, you know, we have to keep fighting. It's something that has, that we, kind of born into this struggle of a social justice, of equity, of all these things, right, that we're working so hard, especially yourself, um, to make sure that we improve and that we completely transform to better serve our communities. And with that, Gabriel, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, your background. Like you said, you've done so much work. I noticed that I read that you were a social worker or at, at the beginning or at some point. Then you became a Chicano studies professor, but you're also a lawyer. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience as a social worker and perhaps what kind of prompted you into that field and how did you then transfer, you know, transfer over to being an educator for Chicano studies? 
Well, you know, I'm not going to give you an answer that's popular, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I, you know, I'm, I've, I've been married for 27 years. Um, and, you know, my wife, girlfriend back then, you know, Pilar, I was, I was 20. And she said, you know, she said, well, you know, I think there's a thing called the master's in social work. And we're, she said, why don't you apply? And I said, sure. You know, and I filled out the application, sent it in. And they're like, hey, you got to, you got to accept it. And we're like, we, you know, we just got married and, and I'm like, so where are we going again? And, oh yeah, we start school at San Diego State on Monday. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, that was, <laughs> that was my world into social work. And, you know, and people are like, oh, really? It wasn't like a map out? No, absolutely not. It, it was map. There was no map at all. Um, you know, someone had mentioned that it was, you know, I think my, my parents earned income in 1988, 89 was like $35,000, right? You know, so, you know, my B is in Chicano studies and it, it was the, it was the hardest degree. I have, a, I have two master's degrees, a PhD in political science and a law degree. And the hardest degree I ever got was my B in Chicano studies. Why? Because, you know, it made me into a student and, and it focused me. And I was appreciative, you know, and from that, the master's degree, the PhD, law degree, it was relatively easy compared to that first degree, which was the Chicago Studies degree with regard to the discipline of studying, writing, paying attention, you know, which, which comes later, right? So then, um, you know, my wife and I, we were at San Diego State. We both have get our master's. One day, a recruiter from LA County says, Hey, do you want to work in Lancaster? You know, I was born in South LA. Um, you know, the only parts of LA that I knew was, you know, South LA and East LA and driving down to Tijuana on the Tijuana on the weekends to see my grandparents and cousins. So, you know, they said, well, the Antelope Valley, I thought, well, I, I think that's connected to the San Fernando Valley, right? <laughs> I didn't realize that the San Fernando, that the Antelope Valley was like, you know, like, an hour and a half away, right? Wow. All the way northern. So then, you know, uh, the recruiter said, well, you know, your, your, wife, your wife and you are going to make $40,000. This is like 1995, I think. And I said, wow, both of us? And the recruiter and the recruiter was like, no, each of you gets to make $45,000 or $40,000, $45,000. I was like, wow, wow. I'm going to make that at 21, 22 years old, $45,000. And I, and, you know, I got a new car, you know, so, you know, I, I was at 21, 22, the youngest county social worker and what well, county, the, uh, uh, the youngest children's social worker too, because I was bilingual MSW, but I got sent into Lancaster, that area. So I worked with uh, child sexual abuse, regular child abuse, methamphetamine. I got, uh, I got sent to, it, it was it was a very interesting experience, but then um, I remember I, um, a professor at Cal State Northridge, Dr. Juan Amora, called me and said, hey, it's time, you know, I've always had mentors, time for you to get your PhD, they're looking for Chicago City's majors, choose your what you want in your PhD, you've got 10 minutes. So it, I'm like, do I choose sociology, political science, history, you know, what do I do, what do I do? You know, I called my brother, honestly, which one is, which one is, am I more interested in political science? Then I talked, I said to Dr. Juan Amora, hey, can my brother get one too? You know, and that was how I ended up getting my PhD in political science because a mentor was looking out for me. And I called my brother Enrique. He was working for Congressman Javier Becerra at that time. You know, he, then Enrique decides, hey, I'm going to go to Irvine. I go to Claremont. Honestly, that's how it happened in those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, I got into University of Pennsylvania Law School, but at that time, I don't think I was ready for law school. Um, so that's how I got into the PhD. It was a trajectory, mentorship, people saying, hey, go that way. Hey, turn right, turn left. You know, um, it wasn't like I said, oh my God, I'm going to be this great political scientist. But in that whole time period, you know, the mentorship that I got at, at Cal State Northridge, you know, as, as a, I was a chair of Mech at that time period, um, you know, I was an AS senator. People helped each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there isn't one leader in history, not one leader 
I can think from King to, to everyone who has said, oh, I'm not going to do your radio show. Well, I'm not going to be on your YouTube channel. No, you, if you want to communicate with folks, you know, you, you, to me, I'd rather be here than anywhere else. I mean, your channel is authentic. You know, and again, you know, it's, you know, people are like, well, do you disagree? You know, they see your, you know, do you know what that's what she said? I'm like, well, maybe, I don't know. You know, I'm assuming she said something, but, you know, she has 9,000 followers. You know, you, I, I said, you know, and, you know, you, you are an influencer, you know, and I think this is in Chicano studies. This is where I need to be right here. That's why I'm here. Thank you so much, Gabriel, for that. And absolutely true about mentorships. I think that's something that a lot of people are shy from. You know, I always tell people we need mentors. You know, we didn't grow up with mentors perhaps in junior high, high school, but when you go to college, we definitely need mentorship. That is amazing, connecting, networking. Um, you know, what I wanted to get into first before we get into Chicano studies, CRT, more conversation that way. I really wanted to ask you, you know, I have a friend that reads a lot of articles about lawyers and law firms and all this. And there was one thing striking that she found out or that she read in an article recently, actually. I'll, I'll send it to you when we're done. Mm -hmm. But basically talking about the disproportionate number of white judges compared to lawyers and the whole idea of, you know, do you think that those numbers impact the way that people are sentenced as far as, you know, black indigenous people of color, how does that ratio impact, you know, those sentences, the legal system, because I don't remember have the stats off the top of my head, but they were pretty, pretty, you know, pretty decreased, like the number of white judges, the number of brown, black lawyers, and then we have obviously a completely disproportionate amount of people that are going through the system, going through the legal system. Is that something that you can talk about, like what that looks like as a lawyer when you're going in there? And does that matter as far as when it comes to sentencing our communities? So let's, let, let's start off with, you know, uh, um, you know, the, the, you know, sometimes the, the panethnics, uh, I call them the panethnic, right? New, you know, um, in terms of Latino, Hispanic, and, and the other ones, um, because that's kind of what the system, you know, uses, right? Um, you know, and I, re and I refuse to use some of them, you know, one of them is Hispanic, right? That I refuse to, to use um, because, it, it, because of what it means. But in terms of the, the state bar, the other day I was doing my census, and literally, I'm like, well, why do I have to do the census, right? And I, I was like, oh, state bar says you have to do it. I did it, right? Then I'm like, oh, it was the best decision I, I made because, oh, you know, it checks, you check off. Okay, Latino, okay. And, um, and, and, and of course, everyone knows that Latino really doesn't mean it. It's a, it's a general ca category. But then it goes down to Mexican, Central American. It goes down all, all the way. Um, seven, only seven, California is 40% Latino. 80% of that is, is Mexican. Probably, I think if you take Mexican, Central American, 90 to 95% of Latinos are in California are either Mexican or Central American. Okay. Only 7% of the attorneys are Latinos. In 1990, it was 3.9%. Literally, you have these numbers that aren't really going up, right? Where the population of, of, of Latinos, I think in 1970, we were 7 million. Right now, we're 60 million. So, so I mean, the, 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 our, our proportion is, is, is really, so to, to talk to about judges means you have to talk about attorneys. And, and it's just, we're not there. And, and the reality is, and, and we'll probably get to it, is that we've got to begin touching on the issue. You know, there's three things that I, I, that I, I like, um, that, that I think are very important. My brother and I are coming up with a new article in a few weeks, and that is um, anti-Indigenism, anti-Mexicanism, which all go together, three basic paradigms, then multilingualism and disproportionality, is that you have this dispor disproportionality of 7% of the attorneys are Latinos, because there's a significant amount of discrimination 
and structural racism that occurs, you know, at the early stages of education that we're not getting over here, right? So for instance, right now I'm working on expungements, people who have felonies and misdemeanors. And if you're out there thinking, you know, well, yeah, you know, you're helping felons. Well, think about it. You know, it could be people at the wrong place, wrong time that are trying to get it expunged. People working on family case law, on family law issues, right? Everyone needs an attorney at some point for something, right? It may not be. So what you're seeing a lot is, and what the state bar did, and I give them credit, they, they did reduce the cut score to pass the bar, which is improving somewhat. But we're looking at a need of, of increasing the amount of brown attorneys by at least eightfold. I mean, and that means that we've got to take a lot, there's a lot of policy actions that need to occur because the more folks you get to be attorneys and after five years of being an attorney, you can become a judge, right? Either through appointment or election. Now, why is it important to, to have um, judges and attorneys that look like folks? First of all, it's almost a silly, it's a silly question. I mean, you, you, you're supposed to have society represented in all of its professions, not just attorneys, medical doctors, teachers, social workers, engineers, every part of society, right? We're not just making money off of us, right? So attorneys make money, a lot of money off of us. We're 50% we're of L, Latinos are 50% of LA County, 40% of the state, you know? So a lot of people make a lot of money off of us except it doesn't stay in our community because we're locked out of these professions, right? So anyway, that's a long, it's a long, it's a, it's a long answer to say, you know, I decided to go to law school, you know, when I was 38 years old, I'm 48 now, basically because I thought, you know what, there's more to do. Um, you know, I, I worked in the profession of social work. I ran, you know, certain nonprofits for a certain amount of time. And you shouldn't stay in some of these positions forever you should be there build move on i think when i think people make the mistake of staying a little too long and now i'm in the world of uh, you know i i have the the buena law firm at, at buena law.com you know that you know i've got the the you know the youtube channel um, um i'm writing a lot and i'm choosing to write with my brother enrique because we tend to get along a lot um he writes certain things he he when we write it takes a long time becomes because we come to like a negotiated settlement of what we want to write. Um, he has a certain style and and perspective that we work through it in order to get to what we believe is important for the audience, right? And I'm doing a lot of things. I consult on on, on Chicano studies across the nation with school with certain school districts and presentations. You know that I do a lot. You know, um, I sign non-disclosure agreements because a lot of them, you know, don't want to know that a Chicano studies expert is coming in to, you know, to, to you know, to, to consult. Um, so I do a lot of different things. Um, if I was an attorney full time, I'd probably not want to be an attorney. But um, if I was just a Chicano studies professor, nothing wrong with that. But my personality requires I do a lot of different things. So, oh, and I have a certificate in barbecuing, by the way. Wow. <laughs> We're More brisket ribs. <laughs> <laughs> we got to put that to test. Not just <laughs> All right. Oh, absolutely. I make brisket and ribs. Oh, in fact, on Buena News, I did make one. Um, I did do a show about barbecue during the pandemic. Okay, definitely. Got to check that out. <laughs> and um, now, as far as Chicano studies, you know, you've been teaching at Cal State Northridge since 1999, if the bio mm -hmm. is correct. Um, what is some of kind of what do things interconnect for you as you're teaching Chicano studies, you know, you are a lawyer, you're on the board, like what is how is that different from other Chicano studies professors that don't have right that that access and that position in society when you're coming in, you're coming in with all these um, hats that you're wearing, right? Like how does that help you? How does that make it a unique teaching experience and what do you walk away with at the end of the semester for your classes? So I, I think, you know, um, I've always, I mean, I started teaching at CSUN, I think when I was 25, 26. Um, Rudy Acuna, I was, I was doing my qualifying exams at Claremont and he said, hey, 
um, Gabriel, who he called me Güero. Um, <laughs> if you know Rudy, he has a name for every single person that, that um, would probably, in order to pass your qualifying exams, you need to teach. You know, and you know, those of us at CSUN, yes, Rudy. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's you know, we're very protective of Rudy, you know, and and you know, we anyway, but that's another that's a, that's for another whole show. So he said, teach. And I said, you know, yes, Rudy. Um, and that's how I started. And um I brought in and and so basically Rudy and a few of the folks at that time had me teaching the Chicano politics classes because I was in political science, some of the history classes, and they would check in on me. Hey, you know, um, uh, uh, they wanted to see lesson plans. They wanted to see this. Um, it was, um, they were actually very tough on me, you know, the first few years. And I was one of the first, I am one of the oldest online Chicano studies faculty at Cal State Northridge um, because no one wanted to teach distance learning. It was called distance learning. Um, it was called correspondence learning, and it was about emailing students. And I said, well, why can't we use this technology to communicate? And they're like, yeah, 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 whatever. In fact, my dissertation was, what is the vision of Latino elected officials with regard to information technology policy in the state of California? That was my dissertation in the year 2000. Because right, and right now, technology policy is equity policy. Okay. So, you know, CSUN gave me a lot of freedom. You know, and I had a lot of, I have a lot of conversations with students, you know, with students during, especially during that time period, I, I, I like taking the entire class to Don Ricardo's at the, at the Northridge Mall, that for $1.99, you know, you can get huevos, huevos con chorizo, beans, rice, tortillas, you know, and I would just take the class, spend a hundred bucks, and we'd have conversations about once a semester, you know, so those conversations were very helpful. Now, and I was 26 at the time. Now, one of, some of my students, 20 years later, you know, as I, you know, passed the bar, have had 15 years experience as attorneys. <laughs> so, you know, so some of the, because at that time they were 18 and I was 26, right? So now I'm 48 and they're 40, you know? So, you know, I didn't realize during that time period that I was that young, you know, and, and, and it was almost like I was their older sibling, you know, turn, you know, during that time period. So, you know, that's how it occurred. And, you know, and I've been there since. CSUN gave me a, for, a forgivable loan. So I had to teach for 10 years, but that went, like, like, went by like that. It, that didn't really matter. One day they said, oh, your loan was forgiven. Oh, okay, thank you. It's like, it's like a cross-country race when you, you know, go through the first half mile. So that's my experience at, at, at Northridge. And, you know, Northridge is a very special place because there's 77 zero Chicano Studies faculty. Um, seven zero. It's a massive department, and folks generally get along. You know, people are always talking about the crab syndrome. You know, Mexicans, Chicanos, we're not getting along, and we generally get along. You know, it's it's you know, yeah. Look, a lot of us sometimes we argue, but everyone argues. Mm -hmm. You know, and what's interesting is that every ethnic group that I've that that I've that I've interacted with, they all say, "God, you know, you Latinos, you Mexicans, you guys all get along. Do you guys ever argue?" Them. <laughs> right, you know. but everyone else thinks that the grass is greener on the other side mm -hmm. you know and I was remindful you know folks of that so you know when I was running nonprofits, I I, I we I, I, there was opportunities for internships for students um, and I talked about a lot of what I was doing so I always encourage students to you know do similar things get their master's in social work I always told students, protect your finances first in life. Mm -hmm. Be able to have medical insurance, you know, um, and, and, and earn as much as you can. You know, it's not about being materialistic. It's about protecting your family's um, future, you know, having a home, having health insurance, having security. So we would have these conversations because I would have, I taught a class called Social Institutions in the Chicano Community. So we would have these discussions about, you know, and some of, the, some of my students now after decades have said, hey, I appreciate because, you know, some of my students would say, you know, they would come to me and say, Professor Puebla, you know, do I ask for a raise? They're like, and, and I would say, what's the range of they're asking for? Oh, between 20 and 25. And I say, ask for 27. They're like, why? 
I said, because you have to push the limit, push the limit, ask for more, demand more. And they're like, oh, okay. And I said, demand it. And, and let's see what come back. Oh, I, they gave me 26. All right. You were willing to settle for 23. You know, so, so you, you know, you've got to be pushy sometimes. And, and it goes a, a, a lot of what our parents have taught us, you know, sometimes in our, in our, you know, in our community, you know, this is where sometimes I don't accept when people say, well, you know, you know, um, not all of you have to go to college. You know, I'm like, they don't say that in other communities. So I do say, yeah, we do. We all have to go to college every single last one. You choose what you have to do, but you go to college and every one of you, need, you know, can be a doctor, a, 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 an attorney, a dentist, do whatever you can, go the maximum. Oh, you know, but some of them, you know, it, you know, no, look, folks tend to say those things to us, you know, and I just don't accept them. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely true. I've, I've heard that too growing up. You don't have to go to college. You can make it other ways. And um, it's interesting because I, I had to write my general English exam at Cal State LA because that's the one that, you know, the proficiency exam. Yeah, yeah. that we're afraid <laughs> of, right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and you know, I, I could write, like I could write for a long time. So what it was interesting because I wrote about why, because the, the question, the prompt was, why are you going to college or why are you here? Mm -hmm. And then I wrote something like, you know, policymakers, people that have control to law, legal systems, who are in control of what affects our lives, our health, everything about our life is governed by people with education, with degrees, that they have access to these positions of power that influence my life. And I remember mm -hmm. writing about that, and I, we can't keep it, obviously we had to turn it in. But uh, I want to say, yeah, like it's it's so important, and a lot of people, even myself, I, I'm an activist. But when I finished, I was like in my late twenties when I really started to say, you know what, I need to finish up school. I can't, I can't just continue living life. I'm activist, speaking here and there. I want access. I want, I want to be there. Like I deserve to be in these institutions. I deserve that opportunity. And obviously learning about the civil rights movements, the Mexican experience, like it's a very historical place that we are in. And I think a lot of students, you know, we're not taught that, you know, we're not, it's not something that we grew up thinking. We think that college is, oh, it's not for us, but we don't know about all these racist laws that existed to keep us out, you know, to keep us limited from this access. So absolutely, I think, that's really important, you know, that, that you talked about that. Um, speaking of, of college and Northridge, I actually wanted to share, I went to Cal State Northridge when I was about 17 years old, 16 years old. I, was, I spoke there, I gave a, a talk about identity, and um, I was really, really um, excited about Fermin Herrera. Uh, oh. <laughs> I don't know if he's still there, he probably retired. No, 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 he's still there, pre-Fermin Mesoamerican History, Chicano Studies 401. You know, Beautiful. you know, so, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I, absolutely, you know, and, you know, so no, no, but, and, but I mean, is a friend, um, you know, his, his, his sons, his, his sister, talk about, you know, you know, a family, you know, that the Herrera family, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's interesting because Rudy Acuña obviously was very important to the development of, of Chicano studies at CSUN, but you also have different individuals in different families, you know, the Herrera family. You know, a Fermin and Chavela, um, and you know, just it, a lot of the faculty there that have put the dozens of people that have, you know, and, and one of the things that the, the things that about CSUN is that the the goal of the Chicano Studies Department is to affect thousands of students on a regular basis. I mean, we have that goal. You know, it is it is education for the masses. You know, so what, what we're doing, you know, Sitlani, you know, here is Chicano studies, um, you know, and we're taking it, you know, when people are like, well, you know, why are the Chicano studies professors and what are they doing? That's you and I. That's why we're having this conversation to try and instigate others to be more curious about stuff, mm -hmm. right? And to not accept stuff and also to articulate their ideas. You know, they don't have to be there. First of all, there is no perfect idea. 
there is no authority on who's right or who's wrong mm -hmm. that does not exist so if someone tells you you're wrong you know look it's hard because you get criticized right and some people are really mean you know <laughs> and and they're just sitting right there waiting for someone to to you know eat po they're eating popcorn and oh my god someone has a new idea and they like they have a a, a bat you know just to knock it down mm -hmm. so you know if you if you make a decision and I think you said it best in one of your interviews, blue pill or red pill. Right? What is <laughs> right. that for your, for your audience? What's the, what's oh, the, the familiar with the classic film, the matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's one pill. You stay in the matrix in the illusion in this false reality. And the other pill gives you complete access to the real world. You get to live the real world. You get to see, who's behind the illusion, who's behind the, the manufacturing of your world. And so that's what people say. Do you want to, ignorance is bliss, in other words. Do you want to take the pill where everything is fake, but you're happy? Or do you want to take the pill where you get the rawness of the reality that's really happening? It's not as pretty. It's a lot of, you know, a lot of things that you have to challenge, but it's real. Right. So that's I, I love that that film because it speaks volumes about you can like you can apply that to everybody. Right. It's such a global message about ignorance is bliss. You know, just participate in this system, be used as a and or the other system is be be the agent of change, be someone that's actually knows who's running the show, knows how how this is all set up and changing that, transforming it. And in some cases, taking it completely apart and bringing something new. So that's, that's what I like using that, that mm -hmm. phrase. Well, you're right. I mean, because, you know, you, you make a decision. A decision is made at your mind. You can make, you could be a five-year-old who's make a decision, you know, I want to make a change in this world, or you could be a 24-year-old, or you can be a 54-year-old, you know, but you, your conscience about making the decision about what you're going to do in life. These are conscious decisions, you know, and, and you know, um, some people listening might say, no, 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 that, no. it is, it's, it's a conscious decision, you know, and, you know, I, I, I've made, you know, I'm lucky to be an elected official. I'm lucky to have a PhD in political science. I'm lucky to be an attorney. I'm lucky. I could say to myself, it's mine. Or figure out, you know, have I made mistakes? Absolutely, I've made mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, absolutely. You know, ever, you know. I, I think I saw someone. You know, um, uh, I, I know you always challenge Telemundo, which you should. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but the, the the president said one time. You know, I've probably done three great things in my life, but that means I've failed at least thirty times. You know, to get those three, um, and, and she was right. You know, you you have to do continuous. You know, um, you've done over how many shows? About a hundred something. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I can't keep up. Before you know, YouTube, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, but but you have to keep going and mm -hmm. keep going and keep going, right? Um, it, until one day, I, I think who's the singer Adele, who who said, "I didn't get popular until one day when she was older." And I think in her fifties, she got popular, right? But most of her life, she wasn't. She was singing you know, in, in, in nightclubs, you know, and, and, but you just keep going and you don't give up, you don't give up. And one day, you know, you're, you're going to hit, something's going to click, mm -hmm. right? And in public policy, you know, th there's, you know, a lot of times in politics and policy, things keep going yeah, naturally until, you know, and that's called incrementalism, mm -hmm. you know, until one day because of all the communication that's occurred because of all these things you have what's what's called punctuated equilibrium that one day there's a big movement yep. you know that happens right and the question is it will happen right and you had that in the 60s you had some of it in the 90s i'm talking about with brown with chicano brown communities right mm -hmm. the question is is there a big punctuated equilibrium spike coming mm -hmm. and you know and people are like like in the, like with the financial bubbles are trying to predict that and i would say that it's inevitable inevitable because our numbers are so bad let me give you a and not that i want to promote the show or anything but uh, you know not i mean i'm sure your viewers have amazon prime right 
and you look at the show uh, Bosch, um, mm -hmm. and you look at that show, LA is 50% brown, you know, um, either Central American, Mexican, uh, Mexican, Central American, Latino, right? How do you walk around the show? And, you know, L Latinos are only about 20% of the cast members. And folks are like, well, you know, do, do, you want, do Latinos need to be everywhere? Well, but you need to be accurate. You need, I mean, you need to be accurate of what's there. I mean, on the Food Network, you know, um, not that I watch too much TV or anything, right? They're having all these food truck shows, right, out of Los Angeles. Not one of them is Chicano. Mm -hmm. Not one of them. Oh. I, I'm like, I'm like, you know, that's why um, there's a show on, on the Food Network, Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, right? Where that show is successful because we're represented well. They're always going to these different Mexican restaurants, Central American restaurants, Peruvian restaurants, and because you can't hide that when they think about food, you can't hide political political expediency in food, right? People want to know, is it Peruvian food? Is it is it <laughs> Peruvian Mexican fusion? People yep. want to know. You can't say, oh, this is Hispanic food, because that doesn't mean anything. Yep. You know, and you can't hide from that, right? And you know, and Anthony Bourdain before he passed away, you know, talked about that, right? That you know, we're we're always we're always um, we're always like the system is very happy to for us to buy their stuff, right? Um, to serve, you know, mm -hmm. we we are the children, we are, but don't you be asking for quality Mexican. Mm. you know central americans south americans like you say right mm -hmm. don't you know don't you ask for an equal amount of teachers that's too much right and 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 i know you're gonna ask about critical race theory right mm -hmm. but you can't get into understanding why our proportions are so bad without understanding critical race theory it's impossible mm -hmm. because that's the articulated response look in 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 1850 um, you know, a, 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 a Chinese man was killed by, um, I forget the case name, by, by a white man. Um, the, the, um, the witnesses um, were, were black. Um, he was convicted, overturned. Why? Because California did not use, used to recognize that only whites could be witnesses against whites. Oh. Now, the system... You know, um, you know, because right now the discussion with critical race theory doesn't want that to be taught, right? Because, because wait, wait a minute, if you know that, then you know why people, why, why police brutality has been an issue. You know why people lost their land. You know why people, it's not making things up. You know why things occurred. Let, let me give you an example. On, on the corner of Temple and Main here in Los Angeles, it's called Fletcher Square. That was the original site of the Alta California um, um, legislature. That site right there. There is not one historical marking for that. All of the all of the Mexican, Native American historical landmarks have all been removed. You know, and it, they've been removed because people in history know that you 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 control people by removing any sense of history, yeah. you know? And, and as we're, I did a documentary for, for your viewers called Outlawing Shakespeare, the battle for the Tucson mind, yep. you know, Outlawing Shakespeare, Google, I mean, Google, yeah, YouTube, it. Outlawing yeah, Shakespeare. It, the it's history. on my list of questions coming up. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I, 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 I but I'm connected. So I, I know, I know I'm talking too much. So go no, on. no, no, it's all good. It's all good. And, and you know what? It, it's interesting because, Two comments before I go on to critical race theory. As far as like, you know, cuisines and all this food, I kid you not, Gabriel, every Thai restaurant, every uh, Middle Eastern restaurant, every Chinese restaurant that I've gone to, the cooks, and I, the, this could be just my, my personal experience, are most of the time Mexican or Central American cooks. You know, my favorite Thai restaurant in Huntington Park is called Tasty Thai. Been going there for like, 30 years, no, like 20 years. Um, the cook, his name is Benito, and I love him. Like, we, we're friends. Every time I go, he knows what my plate is. 
And it's like, I tell him, you should start your own Thai restaurant. Like you, you mastered this. Like you're, he's like the best cook that they have, you know, and I have similar conversations in other restaurants. Anyway, so just to speak to that. And then another thing I wanted to talk about is when you look at critical race theory, um, I did a search. I'm always wondering what's the conversation? What's the hot topic? What's happening? If you look at YouTube, and you go and you clear your, your you know, clear your cache, clear your, your web history so it doesn't do the algorithm on you. Most of the videos that you will find are anti-CRT, like completely anti-critical race theory. My Instagram, you know, the algorithms, even though it's a very, you know, very progressive, some will say radical post, I get these anti-CRT posts that are flooding my, my timeline. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense. Like why? Like, and it's, it's hard to push back. And I was tempted to do something, but I honestly do not know enough to actually substantiate like an actual video or post, but I am shocked to see the aggression, the time of people are dedicating hours, their whole days in meetings. Like you shared with me uh, a recent um, uh, news article or a report actually um, that these are these parents, right. That talked about, the evils of critical race theory. But it's interesting because what, what the media is not showing is that a lot of those parents, they're actually critiquing not just critical race theory, but they're critiquing the Mayan, they're calling them human, you know, human sacrifice gods. They're critiquing the Aztecs. They're critiquing our, our culture, our ancestors, like who we are. So it was interesting to me to watch the where they do the open mic, right, or the, or the open commentary, mm -hmm. that the, the underlying, of course, we could get into what their motives are, but they were disgusted that students are learning about the Aztec and learning about the Mayan, and they're making their own conclusions, but the way they were talking about, oh, these kids are learning about human sacrifice, and the, and the cultures were so savage, and so, you know, I'm not verbatim, right, but it was like, wow, that was a huge insight for me as far as what the discussion is that they're having behind closed doors about what is critical race theory and who is being incorporated into this narrative of history. Um, but for our, for our viewers, you know, it's very, really, really complicated for some people. I would like to ask you if you can kind of give us what is critical race theory as you know, I know it's going to be complicated, but just give us a, a simple response if you may, and why it's important, and perhaps why are some people so afraid? And then this conversation, I'm going to go into the documentary after we we touch upon that. Okay, so <clears throat> critical race theory basically basically is saying, look, there there have been certain structures that have been in place over centuries, right? Um, and, and, and depending on the region, right? Here in California, in the Southwest, you had the mission system. You had, you know, you, we've had different layers of systems. You had, you know, prior to the American system, you had the Mexican system, which became independent from the Spanish system, you know, and all those interacting systems, right? And those systems created laws, expectations, um, and behaviors, right? And, and prejudices that have led folks to be where they're at in their, in, in, with regard to their education, right? So, you know, for instance, with anti-Mexicanism, right? Anti-Mexicanism at its core comes from anti-Indigenism. Anti-Indigenism comes from when the Europeans arrived they viewed all brown folks, right? It didn't matter where, as less than, as not human. It wasn't until the 1560s where, where it was decided that, that the quote unquote natives had souls, right? So you have this perception from the minute, and, and, and hours in in the book, People's History of the United States goes over this, right? Is that they were less than, you were not equal. And, and here is the concept, again, of equality. So if you look at these people and you're only using, using them as your slaves, you can kill, you can do all the evil things to them, and there are no consequence. 
So that gets into your mind over time, right? And, 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 and based on the Spanish system and the English system, but let's just let's say go to the Spanish system, right? That, that if you were, if you were hundred percent indigenous and, and or, or, or black, you were at the bottom. And, and that meant that you actually did not have rights, no property rights, no right to, no right to, to ask for any assistance from the law. Um, you would not get education. You would not get all these things, right? So you have that for centuries. Then, okay, then all of a sudden, wherever you're at in either Latin America or United States in the 19th century, you're generally free. Okay, but you have no education. You have no land. You have no, and the system that's around you hates you literally is hunting you literally is killing you you know if you you know um if you you cannot be a witness so are you know literally you're surviving in an environment that is completely toxic you know that 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 you know how in the world are you going to become a scientist a doctor an attorney like generations now can so it's it doesn't it's not until the 19 it's not until um um you know, Westminster, you know, the Board of Education, uh, Mendez v. Uh, uh, Westminster, until a lot of these cases and civil rights movements that occur in a lot of different communities. You have the Black Civil Rights Movement. You have the, I'm not going to say the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, but you have Mexican-American movements of the 40s, 30s that are fighting for people's rights. You have in the late 1800s, people fighting, the, you know, um, a lot of mov movements, right? A lot of people think it starts in the 1960s. It doesn't. It goes back decades worth of activism. You know, the generation of the 60s, you know, come from the generation from, you know, from World War II. So my point is, is that critical race theory, specifically, you know, Chicano critical race theory, goes through a lot of those systems to explain where we're at. Why are we only 7% of the attorneys? Well, we're 7% of the attorneys because you've had a lot of these structures, you know, that have literally held us back. And in order to increase those numbers, let's say we were to make a decision, we're going to increase those numbers from 7 to 15% in, in, within 10 years. That means you've got to go back into the systems and you've got to restructure them. You've got to, you, you've got to increase budgets by, five, by five-fold in order to demand that the system do what it does, right? So critical race theory says, hey, You've got to make up for all those decades and centuries by investing a significant a lot, and you've got to have these discussions. Now, for those audiences, for those in the audience, I'm not discussing it perfectly. I, I'm not, okay? And I think both you and I would agree that we're not perfect in this discussion, but it's a general understanding of, of where we're at. And race, your skin color, your gender, your sexuality, we're all intertwined in how you are being treated right now it is now and those who are against it are saying well that's making race a center part of everything well my response is we didn't do that your ancestors did that we didn't do that that's not that's not a me issue that's a you issue mm -hmm. you know and 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 what what occurred here on critical race theory is that tucker carlson carlson had a show then he got called into the White House. Then the White, then Trump created his executive order. Because things have a loop, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how it became very important. So if you're an audience member right now, you know, get you know Laura Gomez's book, or the other day you had a, a book on you know on on there on you know there are books. This mm -hmm. is not this is not you know maybe you can list some of them. We don't lack for an understanding of these uh, of these books, and the literature is out there. Yep. Um, and I think what Sitali and I are doing right now for you is saying, go check out some of those books, put comments, question us. We're not saying we're perfect in this conversation. Yep. We're encouraging you to dialogue, create your own YouTube channel, write your own stuff. Um, and, you know, we will agree, but we're not going to be, you know, my thought is, none of us need to be mean and disrespectful to each other as we're having conversations, right? We just need to have those conversations. That's generally what, you know, what I'm saying and hopefully leading people to have those ideas and visions 
and implement them in what they're doing in their jobs and what they're doing in their life in conversations about, over carne asada and whatever you're doing <laughs> or ribs or brisket um in you know in order to make that happen so that's why i think critical race theory without having an understanding of critical race theory specifically in chicano and brown and and other and, and other latino communities um and you have look the discussion that's going on with puerto rico and 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 whether statehood or independence it's critical race theory who controls you know the the the, the production you know um non-american um, uh, ships cannot stop in puerto rico puerto rico doesn't have you know why why is that important you know, so you just can't say it's Chicano critical race theory. No, it's Puerto Rican critical race theory. Mm -hmm. It's Cuban American critical race theory. Central American critical race theory. You know, and and these are these aren't competing. They're just different and accentuating. In fact, they have to work together. If you're not, if you're not, if you're if you're Mexican American and you're not understanding what's happening with your Salvadorian brethren or your Cuban American brethren, you're missing something. Um, you, in fact, I would think you're, 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 you're missing a lot in your analysis because you can't understand the Chicano experience, in my opinion, without having a fuller Latin American understanding of, of, that, of, of that experience. And, and, and in the meantime, we have to use certain words like Latin American to describe it, but here we are. Thank you. Thank you for, for answering that. And I wanted to just share, I didn't come across critical race theory until the summer of 2015 when I was taking a Chicano course at Cal State LA, and for the first time in my life, I came across, or I was taught about the a Chicano educational pipeline and the work from UCLA and how they, you know, their branch of critical race theory. And to me, that was amazing. The amount of research that is done to show what are the inequities in education, what's lacking, which we're gonna get into right now, but to me, it was amazing that there was this thing called critical race theory, which I, now looking back, a lot of the stuff, the research that I've done is very, you know, it could fall under critical race theory if you look at the, the, the tenets of critical race theory. So if anything, I was like completely inspired, completely um, empowered to continue the work that I do because it's like, if it's a very global, right? It's a very global experience that we're going through and this kind of this deconstructing of how power works and who it benefits. Critical race theory is the ideological engine um, to that, that to, to, for folks to understand. Um, without understanding critical race theory, people are going to say, why can't Latinos all get along? Why can't all that? You need to understand critical race uh, th mm -hmm. theory. Um, in whatever way you want to understand it, right? Because I don't, I don't want someone listening on YouTube to, to think, oh, you know, you have a way. No, 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 I'm not saying that. You, you digest some of this literature stuff in the way you want to digest it and you articulate it in the way you want to articulate it. The reason I'm saying that is that everyone always wants to tell the other person what to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to do that, yeah. no you have your own idea, you know, you challenge me, you challenge Citlali, you know, and in that, we're going to learn from you, because it's a cop-out to say, oh, you know, you know, uh, you know, it has to follow this, you know, this is the branch, it's perfect, uh, no, 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 that, that's harmful, um, you know, to everyone's thought process, you know, in, in listening to some of your shows, I'm, th I'm just thinking to myself, what is Citlali talking about, um, <laughs> you know, and, and it's not a critique, it's I'm observing you and what you're doing, you know, and some of it I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not sure if she connected that to that to that, but that's how I'm analyzing it. You know, you know, in, in Spanish, cada, cada cabeza es un mundo, every head is a different world, right? So it's just, I, I'm very against everyone always trying to tell everyone that mm -hmm. they have to think in one certain way, you know. Um, you know, and, and not thinking that they have to evolve. But sometimes evolution, as things evolve, you're like, oh, that didn't work. And you kind of go back to, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if someone said, well, the taco is wrong. You know, it, it's a wrong use of technology. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it works quite well, you know, and thank you very much. You know, if you can come up with a, with a orange red, you know, a tortilla, you know, uh, in the tortilla combo, you know, with a special type of carnita, 
you know, then we'll try your type of taco, right. but, you know, but we're going to stick with the taco. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, and you're absolutely right. Cause honestly, I've been doing YouTube videos for 13 years mm -hmm. and I debated if I should remove some of my old videos. Cause you know, I didn't know that much and I needed a lot more research, but then I was like, no, that's who I was at that moment. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I knew. That's what I was going on. And you compare my video from 2008 to 2021, you're going to see my evolution, right? Mm -hmm. As, as a thinker, as, as a historian. So it's like, and I'm not ashamed of that. It's like, that's who I was. And then now who knows a few years from now, probably be different, right? And what I'm saying, but there should be growth, right? If we're growing and we're constantly questioning and challenging and learning, I'm hoping that we should, we should all be a little different at least, right? Um, you know, with information and, and research. You know, a absolutely. And, and, and I would say, um, you know, obviously I like the Food Network and you figure that out, right? <laughs> um, there's one show, um, Elton Brown, um, Good Eats, right? And, um, you know, he did a show where he went back 20 years ago and he's like, oops, sorry, did that wrong. <laughs> you know, and, you know, and sometimes, and, uh, you know, sometimes you're like, yeah, I was actually quite right you know, on, on that. Um, and I'm, and I'm glad that I pushed myself at that time period because or else I wouldn't be over here, you know? So absolutely critical, critical, again, critical race theory. You're very critical, right? You're, you're, it's critical to understanding race, but it's also critical of race, right? And it's, and mm -hmm. it's a theory and theories are always evolving, right? So, but, but people are afraid of it because the demographics, obviously the demographics are, are changing, you know, um, and, you know, the amount, you know, uh, of folks in the Senate, in, in the House. Um, and I, but I do think that we are headed in, in one of the most dangerous time periods in American history, outside of the uh, Civil War, War of 1848, uh, the American Revolution, only in the sense of you have folks in certain parts of the, of the country that are undoing what people used to say was, oh, American jurisprudence. And, you know, it was important to follow the law, right? But now that demographics are changing, and that might mean that others, you have states that are saying, no, we don't want that. And most of the people who are implementing a lot of this stuff were either children or infants or weren't born during the civil rights movements <clears throat> of the 1960s. So that means that even after all the learning about race and everything that's going on, you have a lot of these politicians in Georgia and Arizona that have no problem, zero problem, taking rights away from people mm -hmm. and, 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 and people's constitutional rights it doesn't matter, right? That they'd rather have their America the way they knew it, and they'd rather dismantle the Constitution than to see it implemented for someone else. Mm -hmm. And the battle's going to come, are there enough people? What happens if they're successful in 2022? What happens if the Senate flips? What happens if the House flips? What happens if Biden fl uh, uh, loses in, in 2024? There's a lot of what ifs. I mean, Democrats aren't, we're not known to be the most organized folks in, in the world. You know, so if we're not able to hold the Senate, hold the House, then, then, then are you then potentially going to have violence in the streets? I mean, today on CNN, I mean, you had, you know, folks, you know, um, they were interviewing saying, no, we're going to have violence on the streets. It's coming. Well, on January 6th, you already saw it, right? Yep. So, you know, as, look, you know, in terms of Mexicans in the United States, we're 11, 11% 11 of the United States at some, is, is Mexican-American or some connection to that, right? 19% of the entire U.S. population is Latino. All right. So where do we stand on this? You know, where, where, where are we going to... Uh, you know, as as a lot of this stuff is happening, are we seeing the ingredients for that for that protest 
if it's happening in Arizona, if it's happening, mm -hmm. you know, in California, we're kind of safe. We're, we're, we're beyond, you know, we're beyond that level of control, but not in Georgia, not in, not in Texas. Right. Yep. And, and, and that's the, that's the, that's the danger is that in the next few years, are we going to go into a time period of protest on, in, in, in the streets? Right. And, and I think you were going to ask me about, uh, about outlawing Shakespeare. Yes, that's my next okay. question right here. So in 2012, you produced and directed, am I correct? The and, and my friend Fernando, if he was the director, he would kill me uh, <laughs> uh, if, if I said that, you know, uh, so him and I, you know, co-produced it. He was the main producer. A shout out okay. to you, Fernando. All right. And it says, and I quote, the documentary explores how Arizona officials have outlawed books and authors such as renowned British uh, author William Shakespeare because they believe it, that he is to be, he is too controversial. So I'm going to link that um, documentary in this video description. I recommend that you all watch it. It's really, really important and it speaks volumes to what is happening right now. And what I wanted to ask you, Gabriel, is what you know, you are very active in this documentary. You're not just filming and, you know, and the camera talking, but you actually go in the building, you demand to speak to these officials, demand for them to, to talk about the positions that they're taking with the bills. Um, I wanted to ask you, why was this important for you to make? If you can tell people what was happening. I remember going to Arizona a few times. I actually went eight times a few years um, to actually defend the community against our pile and then against these type of, uh, bills. So if you could tell us what, what was the, your thinking process behind it? Why a documentary out of this bill that was banning HB American studies? Thank you. Um, I did that documentary for you. I did that documentary for this particular moment for the, for, to have that conversation because during that time period, Fernando Orozco and I, knew what exactly was happening. And, and again, with me, a lot of things start and end with Rudy Acuna told me to do it, right? Um, and Rudy Acuna kind of told me to do it. Um, <laughs> so he said, he said, um, he said, well, you know, uh, yes, Rudy, how can I help you, Rudy? Um, well, we need to go to, to Arizona. We need to, um, you know, uh, take buses. And I'll say, and I said to him, I'll raise money to take two buses. I need complete access because we need to tell this story. So I found out that Shakespeare was banned, banned in a Mexican American and, 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 the, and, the, and the literally banned, just to be very clear, anyone's listening as in no lo pudieron usar, all right? It was not, you could not use Shakespeare in Ch Mexican American studies classes at the Tucson Unified School District, right? So I was like, huh? <laughs> what, what, what you talking about well this you know um i'm like how does this happen so you know fernando was a former cnn producer and i'm a and i'm a chismoso in chief okay so hence political scientist attorney etc right social worker um, um a, a husband of three a husband of three daughters too okay um and in my chismosoness you know, I knocked on, literally knocked on the door of the Arizona State Assembly, and I said, I'd like to talk to the Attorney General of the State of Arizona, right? And they're like, you would? I'm like, who are you? We are, you know, um, you know a news crew from, from, from Los Angeles, right? I'm in Arizona, so I said Los Angeles, right? So, you know, we interviewed Tom Horn, right? And he's running again for, this was 2012, right? So I, I guess that was uh, nine. So I was 39 years old. All right. So if you look at the documentary, there's a very important part to answer the question, why? Because it's, it's completely relevant to today. I asked Tom Horn, why about, um, why HB 221? And he says, oh, I know. These students want to hearken back to a time of Aslan. They want to make this Mexico again. And he says it on camera. Did you catch that part? You know, and, and I was like, is this the first time in history that a piece of legislation is written in order to prevent a mythical homeland wow. called Aslan by an attorney general of a state of Arizona? The answer is yes. 
He said it. He said it right there in the documentary. We, we, we try and find out, you know, there was another, a Brown legislature, in, <clears throat> legislator, I forget his name now, but it's in the documentary. He wrote the damn thing, you know, because Tom Horn told him. In fact, he, he, um, he fled. We go to his office. He fled the office. <clears throat> we spoke to a security guard. You know, we go to, uh, you know, to, 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 to where his, you know, to, we spoke to some of the congr um, to some of his congregation. We spoke to, um, we interviewed Dolores Huerta. This whole thing started, by the way, literally with Dolores Huerta in 2006, right? And I'm like, okay, we're in 2012. You guys are, literally, I'm confused. You guys are angry because Dolores Huerta said what? And literally, because in 2006, Dolores Huerta says, Republicans hate Latinos. Republicans hate Latinos. I'm like, okay, she said that at Tucson Unified High School. Because of that, and they didn't want her, they tried to get rid of this entire Mexican-American studies program. And they created a list of banned books. One of them was Shakespeare and The Tempest, right? Yeah. So, and, and, you know, so... With this whole critical race theory, and I'm not saying critical race theory only starts with Arizona, it doesn't, right? But if you really want to understand how it affects in terms of the Mexican community, Latino communities, and you hear the voices of the parents saying, look, we needed Mexican American studies because we were told that we were, that we were put in trash cans when we were in kids because we were speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about the, we had footage of kids getting beaten in Arizona because if, if we don't do it, no one was going to do it, Sitali. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality of it. So we, we did that documentary for you. Mm -hmm. And for every generation that followed us, Fernando and I knew that we had an obligation. We had, we had the skill. We raised money. People and the donors are, 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 there, are, are listed right there. And, are, and we wanted people to clearly understand that it is not, you know, because of, oh, you know, um, you know, we need to assimilate in American society. No, you have um, certain folks in American society with brown folks believing that we want to create a, center, a separate country called Aslan, believe that we want to connect back to, you know, to, to Mexico. And we address that question in the documentary. You know, why, you know, why are they thinking a lot of these things, right? And people are denying, oh, you're exaggerating. They're not thinking that. Yeah, they are. I mean, you're talking about the governor of Arizona, the attorney general of Arizona. So when you're talking about critical race theory and institutional racism, it has an address. It has names. It is folks in Arizona. That's your son, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? And look, when we're having these conversations, it, look, the folks out there is that is that you know we have we you know and if you want to bring them into the camera, bring them into the camera. You know, I don't know if you want you know, but but my point is that you know we're all family having a discussion here, right? And children are are are, are part of that. But we did that, Talene, so that you could look at it and 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 cut little pieces on YouTube and say this is what critical race theory is, right? And that is our obligation. Look. I've been given the opportunity to have a PhD law degree. I have a duty, an obligation to do more and to produce more. That's why I did the documentary. And there's another one called Outlawing Dolores Huerta, The Tucson Diaries, which kind of go together. But if, if you want to understand, and, and if you're out there, grab a clip. Put it on, 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 on TikTok, especially that part about Tom Horn saying they're doing it because of a country called Aslan. And he says this, you know, I mean, and I'm like, Fernando and I are like, did he really say that? Yeah, he said it. And we have it on camera. Yeah. And you know what? I think it, I was, I love the documentary. I was like, how did I not come across this before? Honestly, like I'm always trying to learn more. And I was part of the actual protest um, against that bill. And what dawned on me was a gentleman that you interviewed. And he, I love how he says it. He said, because students who take Mexican American studies become leaders, mm -hmm. you know, become, they're politicized. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, so I took that clip and then I started researching. I was like, okay, where can I learn more about this? 2016, uh, Stanford made a, a study that shows, right, that 
uh, ethnic studies benefits uh, academically, mm -hmm. not just academically, but not just in social sciences, but students do well in sciences, in mathematics and biology when they take ethnic studies. Something happens to us, and, and this is something that happened to me. I didn't take ethnic studies in high school. I went to Huntington Park High School in the 90s. And it was like, I had to learn this outside of school. I didn't have this at school. I, luckily, I, I was politicized in other ways. But that whole transformation that happens to you, right, as a young student who has been kept away from you knowing your history, it's not part of the mainstream narrative, and then you learn your history, you walk differently, you talk differently, you perform differently, you succeed, you know, at, at massive levels than that you didn't know your history, because there's something very powerful in that. And I think the person that you interviewed, I loved all of them, by the way, but the way he said it, he was so passionate about it. He's like, because they become leaders. And there's a very political uh, consequence that Tom Horn was fearing. It's like, mm -hmm. these kids are going to take over the government. These so kids. So stop them. Yes. Stop yes. Stop them. Yes. And, 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 this is where, and this is where in Arizona, we knew. And, 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 and literally, we took two busloads, by the way. And, and, and the folks in Arizona were like, why do you guys care so much? And I said, and we said, because it is our duty. You know, it is our duty to take two bus loads. You know, we, we, you know, the students that went with us from CSUN and other campuses too, you know, we took, you know, we took, uh, we took books and reading materials and food, you know, it was a journey, you know, and, it was and do, so doing the documentary and it was it was uh Fernan, like i said fernando rosco uh rob corsini antonio gallo um you know everyone kind of you know came together to you know to make it because it was again <clears throat> outlawing shakespeare the battle for the tucson mind it wasn't for the body it was for the mind you know, and it, once you once you remove critical race theory, Mexican American studies, then you can do with them with whatever you want. You know, and and that's where the documentary became very important because if you if you want to understand why you know what they what they want to do, then understand HB two two eight one. Others will say ten seventy, which is another piece of legislation which was horrible. But I thought this was the more hidden one because this was the critical race theory um, legislation targeted towards Mexican Americans specifically. And people are like, well, it has nothing to do with us. Again, this documentary targeted. We had the mayor of Tucson. We had all these faculty, you know, who, who were, you know, who, you know, who were there who helped with the documentary to like, no, this is happening here. All those students were like, were like, you know, you saw the, you know, the poor students, you know, they were shaken up. They were, you know, and maybe that's the social work in me that came out that those parents trusted us to interview their children. Um, you know, because if my 16 year old was going to be interviewed by, by someone, I'd be like, who in the hell are you? Right. You know, so I put myself, my, and it, <laughs> <clears throat> the irony is that my actually my, my uh, Fernando's family and my family, um, we we all went and we spent a week and a half in Tucson, but they were at the pool hanging out <laughs> because you bring the family right and everything that you you know that you're doing. So you know we had that con. And my wife is a clinical social worker, so you know we thought about how we're going to interview these youth to get these stories out, so that we can now use it Aline, and others and everyone here can take that documentary cut the footage and use it for whatever you're doing and i invite you as open source to use it thank you you know i wanted to talk to you two things to that just two comments the whole language that tom horn used you know in 2017 a lot of the you know, Save Our State people, which kind of were created in the 90s, they were going to a lot of cities and trying to pressure the cities to claim or to obtain a sanctuary city status, which my understanding when those cities did that, they lose a lot of federal funding for mm -hmm. some of the social programs. 
And it's interesting because me and my, a lot of my, my, you know, my colleagues, we went and we, we would defend the city. We would speak out against them. They were going to city hall meetings and they were talking about, we conquered you all, you know, you have, this is America, like the language of conquest, the language mm-hmm. of what happened. Literally. Yes. Like it just happened yesterday. Right. And I have footage I have of these, and not just the, 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 the rhetoric that they use, but these people were coming in with guns, with knives, you know, and I was part of the community that was defending the community because I have grandmas, you know, the kids, like they don't know who these people are. Like, they're just like, what the heck? Like they're just going to the park and there's all these white supremacists with Nazis, the Proud Boys. And so the danger of these rhetoric, the danger what Tom Horn is doing is that people manifest those thoughts into violence. And as you know, uh, Gabriel, the anti-Mexican hate crimes, the anti-Brown hate crimes have plummeted, right? Or recently, especially under Trump. And so the danger- You mean skyrocketed. Thank you, thank you, yes, skyrocketed. And that just shows the danger, you know, the danger that our community faces with this type of presence. Um, Another thing too, it reminded me, I remember going in 2008, I went to Arizona five times that year to fight um, 1070. Uh, It was something, Bill 1070 G. Yeah, 1070. And it was under our pile. And when I was there, I was like, wow, like this is like ridiculous. Like the amount of, 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 of support that was there. And to me, I was like, oh my goodness, I can just see what's gonna come in the future. If this is what's happening in Arizona in 2010 and 2008, like I'm already seeing repercussions and then obviously Trump happens. And so anyway, so my point to that is to say, you know, a lot of the times people minimize what's happening locally, thinking, oh, it's just a bunch of crazy people, nothing's Mm -hmm. gonna ever happen. But that manifests itself so quickly, especially with social media, that just grows and grows. And the danger, the danger of these of these people, of this rhetoric, of this racism, you know, we see And their media is growing. Yes. yes. Their media is growing. They, they used to have only Fox News. They have other other media sources at, 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 at this point, you know. So I, I'm seeing our community not completely understanding you know, what's going on. And, and, you know, so there is, you know, I I am afraid. Yep. And one last thing too about this is in, uh, as a historian, I've studied a lot of the the decrees, right, of the Spanish crown in 16th century Mexico. And in 1577, there was an actual law forbidding indigenous knowledge or what they called the way of life of the indigenous folks. And so I remember writing a poem about that. I remember writing a poem about that law. And then I remember writing a poem about the outlawing of Mexican American studies and the banning of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. My goodness, Shakespeare. You know, it's like the the audacity, the racism, the it's just ridiculous. Like it's ridiculous and it's still happening. Um, And you know what? I wanted to go over to uh, LACCD. I want to go over to you know, you are a trustee on Los Angeles mm-hmm. College, um, Los Angeles Community College District, which is huge. It services about 250,000 students. It's comprised of nine com- colleges in Los Angeles. And I wanted to ask you, you um, shared a, a meeting, which is an open meeting that was held um, in December of last year. And it was a very powerful meeting because in the meeting, we're talking about racial equity, um, and one thing in particular that stood out to me that I wanted to ask you more about, mm-hmm. it says um, there was a survey done, um, an actual study done, and it says, why do people succeed academically when they are surrounded by people that reflect them? You know, it says LACCD findings found that the demographics of students do not match per par to faculty and staff. You know, why does that matter? And what has been done? What was kind of the conversation that, you know, you perhaps are having or what are some of the things that are being done and why it matters that students are actually reflected in the staff and faculty? You know, it's a good question. And, and you know, and it's interesting, right? Because sometimes I put on my, my, my you know, um, it's interesting because you said you're an activist. And, and I've never actually, I'm not saying I'm not that, I just never saw myself as that. I just have seen certain opportunities and I've taken them. You know, like I saw Arizona and I'm like, wow. And I really, 
And I really did see that, right? Because actually I was watching the History Channel and and there was a, a show about how Arizona was part of the Confederacy. And very few people know that Arizona, when it was, it, it was actually part of the Confederacy, you know, and, and it voted to be in the Confederacy, you know, but it was not a state at that time, right? However, when, you know, but they would, and, and they would have had to have skipped over Nuevo Mexico, right? So it would have been like, you know, you know, but it was that, right? So you can't, so to understand, you know, the, you know, the, um, the racial animosity is to understand why we did that. So going back to LACCD, accuracy and representation is very important, right? Because with our communities, what a lot of people will say, you know, if you say, well, like for instance, UCLA came out with the study, it will take 500 years for our community to have an equal amount of medical doctors than there are not for our population, 500 years, okay. So the question is, are we okay with that, right? So can a white doctor be as good a doctor for me? Yes, my, my doctor is, is from India. He's an excellent doctor, I have no issue. I've had, you know, we have doctors and, 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 and nurses from every single ethnicity. There's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> the question is, should our institutions reflect the population? To certain, to a certain reasonable degree, sixty-one percent of LACCD is brown, is Latino, Mexican American, Central American. Only twenty-one percent of, of faculty and staff are Mexican, Mexican American, South American, some combination thereof. Right? That's not a good thing, right? That like if someone would say like, oh, you know, it's because there aren't enough Latinos who are qualified. That's not the case. And come on, you know, there, there, are, there, are, there are millions of us with master's degrees, PhDs, right? And it's all about the hiring committees. It's about decisions from administrators about how to do it. It is about leaders like me, like me, let me, I'm taking full responsibility, saying, how is this part of the overall strategic plan of the entire district, right? But leadership, elected officials, you have to be that specific. You just can't say to the system, oh, go do, Padre Jesuito Santo, I'm going to declare it happen. You can't do that. And you have to say, how is it part of the planning process? You know, who's going to be on the committees? Um, would call, where are the goals of, of uh, where are these goals? You have to be specific. So do I blame the system? Yes. But the other thing that I also blame Citali is within our own elected officials, are we being sufficiently proactive in making this stuff happen? You know, and, and you know, are we, are, we, are we demanding it of the system from the accreditation systems? So we have to, so yes, you have to challenge the system, but the system could turn around at us and say, hey, why are you, are you demanding anything from us? So it's also on us to say to the system, no, it is your responsibility to you know to to do it as well. So that's what we are in in the in the, in in the in the middle of right now. But it takes folks like you specifically and others to continuously ask that question, right? And you know, but we're afraid, right? We're afraid. Is that going to cost me a job? Is that going to cost me tenure? Is that going to cost me this? Is that going to cost me that? I understand that, you know. So. You know, there are ways, you know, people shouldn't have to give up their livelihood <clears throat> just because they're, they're speaking out on, on, on an issue, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why as a trustee, I see it as my job to, first of all, when I'm a trustee, even though I'm a, I, I tell people, I'm a trustee who's a Chicano. I'm not a Chicano trustee. My job as a trustee is to represent everyone equally. In, you know, and even though I, I'm a Chicano Studies faculty member, you know, and everything that we've talked about, my job is to represent everyone equally, and I do. That being said, when you see these large, massive inequalities, a lot of leadership in our community just sits back, you know, and I have a problem with that. You know, and, 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 and look at LACCD, we have a lot of, a, a lot of, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're not a perfect institution. We are a great institution, 
we are challenging each other. You know, we created a, a you know, a, you know, um, you know, Mexican American, Central American, Latino advisory committee, uh, where we're telling members, look, you you develop the agenda, mm -hmm. and, and and you know, and 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 and. You know, and I'm not. Uh, I, I was. Uh, I'm not going to reveal what what you know. Some of the private conversations among you know the the chancellor and I, but 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 we do all have conversations about saying, look, if we want these numbers to change, it's not going to be incrementalism. It's going to be punctuated equilibrium. It's going to mean we need to see a spike, right? But the question for for you, and not a question right now, but it is is how are those who are activists connecting to the systems around them and demanding that those institutions produce? Because if 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 as an elected official we don't hear people fighting for it, it won't happen. And you know what, um, Gabriel. Thank you for sharing that because I was a project match intern in 2019 mm -hmm. and it was an amazing experience. I was honestly shocked with the amount of boldness, the conversations that we had as a cohort, the, the facilitators, you know, oh. it was just such an empowering experience and I don't stay quiet, <laughs> you know, and it felt like a very powerful uh, space. And I was, you know, I was empowered to speak. All of us had really critical discussions about our experiences as students of color attending predominantly white professor led classrooms. Um, a lot of the times like the administration does not reflect us. And so we talked about that very boldly. And one of the things, it was interesting because the day before my, the program culminated, it was my graduation ceremony from Cal State LA. And the, the president of the school gave me a three minute um, acknowledgement for the work that I've done. And it was beautiful. That record, I'll send it to you. And it's interesting because, you know, I'm standing up and he's acknowledging, like you know, talking about my rewards and my GPA and the fact that I was a project match intern. So it was beautiful. You know, I, I sat down, everyone's applauding. And my cohort to my right was a white student who consider himself mixed or some, some type of mixture. But he looks at me and says, wow, I didn't know you made it to Project Match. He's like, they turned down my application. And I was like, really, why, why do you think? And he's like, I guess I wasn't ethnic enough. Mm. And this is, I'm telling you, this is at my graduation ceremony, the president just gave me a three minute, you know, acknowledgement and to sit there and just like look at him and I was like, wow. And I looked at him and I was like, okay, you got to be quick with your response, but you got to say something. So I told him, oh, you know, too bad. Maybe next time I go only 40, about 44 made it out of 500 applicants. I go, you got to do something to stand out more. Something like that. It was very like, I was like shocked, right? That he would tell me this, my cohort of like four years that we've taken courses together. It wasn't a stranger. Well, it was meant to destroy you. Yes. You know, the, his, com his comment was meant to, you know, to that you were less than, less intelligent, you know, than. You know, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so anyway, so I share that because it's like, it's not just happening at the administrative level. It's mm -hmm. like this idea, right, within students, within cohort. I remember being in, uh, in classrooms where people are afraid to speak out, are afraid to confront so certain racist conversations happening openly in the classroom. And I remember thinking, I'm paying too much money. I am paying too that to be able to just sit here and to ignore that I'm not listening to these conversations, ignore that I'm not attending classes with these students. And, you know, I'm a proud alumni of East LA College, which is why I love, I love, I love LACCD and ELAC. But again, it's the, the, the challenge that we as students face is lateral as well as vertical, as well as administration, but also among our own culture of education. Um, and also to speak to that, one last thing I wanted to cover before we start wrapping it up, one of the, the details that was brought up in that meeting, uh, December 17, 2020, I will also link it for our viewers, mm -hmm. is the segregated data. And it was, you had shared that with me, that was, oh my goodness, I was so happy to hear that Latino is not enough. 
The term Latino right. is not enough to, to describe the student experience. It's not enough to talk about, to track access to um, success, right? And the, the way the gentleman worded it was, you know, this monolithic term is not, you know, doing justice to the needs of the students. And it was so, to me, powerful, because I was like, yes, like I've been battling this for decades, but it's now being challenged as a way that it doesn't work. It's not working, right? And I wanted to speak to the article that you wrote um, that was printed and appeared on Latino Rebels, which I will also link on the video description. But two things, if you can talk about what that looks like as a new data is forming to LACCD of disaggregated data, that's not just about what's the ethnic marking or the monolithic term, but what is being done to tailor to the needs of students. Um, and also, lastly, sorry, <laughs> lastly, um, as far as that article that you wrote, right, um, Rethinking Latino. And what, what's the connection between Rethinking Latino as, as yourself, right, as, a, as an educator, as a lawyer, but also what, it's, what it looks like within LACCD and racial equity and how are we, you know, rethinking these terms to better service students. So, you know, it's interesting because that, that article has gotten um, Enrique, my, my brother and I, a, a, lot of, a lot of people have called us and asked, and we said, look, and here's our assessment, right? The, the term, the, the pan-ethnics, have a place, we believe, right? If you look at, if you believe, if you look at, let's say, when they were created, and you've always had pan ethnics, by the way, you've had Spanish American, you know, you've had um, the New York Times in the 1880s um, said beaners in California, and they meant it, by the way. And where, where do you think greasers come? Those were official using names for us in decades, oh, you're exaggerating, you know, and I'm like, no, I'm not, they were, it's in the New York Times, um, so Spanish American, Hispanic, right, these are all terms, these were all terms to subdue any indigenous heritage, right, and, and, and it's, I almost call it like a, like a virtual colonialism, you know, you, you know, the Spanish government doesn't have anything to do with this, it was their ideology that they spewed of, of it's not white supremacy as American society. Laura Gomez does a very good job of this in her book, um, Make, The Making of the Mexican-American Race, where as Mexican-Americans, as Chicanos, we go through, we have different layers of racism. We have the, the uh, when we normally know as white supremacy here in the United States, it's a very different type of, I'm going to say, light skin racism in, in, in Mexico and Latin America, right? So we're, when we're immigrating to the United States, we're immigrating with a lot of these colonial kind of uh, understandings of race. And plus you have the American system. So you have layers of it, right? So in order, if you're, you, in, we need to understand that, so the panethnics were created to say, oh, we're all the same. We all speak Spanish. Well, okay, we understand that we're all human beings. We understand that we have some connections because of colonialism. You know, Puerto Ricans have a struggle, right? We, you know, when we interact with Puerto Ricans, of course, you know, there, there are similarities and no one says we're not. However, you know, the different subgroups, not subgroups, but different groups have different histories. You know, there's 41 million Mexican Americans in the United States, 11% of the population. <clears throat> At LACCD, Latinos are 61%. If you were to just say, oh, what's the Latino community? It's a wrong question. You, like, for instance, Central Americans are the second largest ethnic group within LACCD. First, it's Mexican Americans, then it's Central Americans. The amount of Central Americans are around 20% of the student body at LACCD. Yet the number of representations of Central American in faculty and staff is extremely low. You know, so if you don't understand those numbers, then you don't know what you're demanding. You know, so, so that's part of what we're doing at LACCD is saying, look, we need to understand, is it, 
Is it is it Dominican students that are having issues within Asian Americans? We know that 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 we've done a, a very good job at disaggregating Asian American data, which Asian American elected officials have demanded that, but our officials have not. I mean, you know, so at LACCD, we're saying we're going to disaggregate that in order to be able to target folks better for services. For instance, we have a significant amount of indigenous languages being that, that are used within LA, right? Do we know the zip codes or the census tracts where they're being spoken in order to speak with them in those languages? Why do we always have to immediately go to Spanish? If potentially, for instance, I've had, I've had, I've had um, clients in, 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 in privately as an attorney who speak better their indigenous language it's Spanish as a second language, so it's no use. So we bring in an indigenous language interpreter that will go from indigenous language to English because it's useless to go from indigenous language to Spanish to English, right? But, but we're still kind of naive that this isn't a reality. We, we, they're outside of Mexico City, LA has more Mexicans than Guadalajara. You know, that means that, that we have to understand that we are a complex micro um, micro, um, uh, uh, a micro system, you know, here. So to just say Latino, it's not only not helpful, it, it, it potentially um, doesn't allow us to understand. So that means that at LACCD, we want, or we are developing more Chicano studies. We are developing Central American studies. We want to develop Latin American studies certificates. Um, you know, and but representation means re being represented like folks in Chicano studies. I, I always believe in being, um, you know, a little different. I'm like, why isn't there Chicano studies in the culinary programs? You know, why, you know, why, you know, why can't we have the community coming in and making tamales uh, for Christmas and have tamales and teaching those, right? Why do we have to only learn it? Oh, that's for the grandma. Oh, so you get to teach you know, European, you know, culinary principles, which fine, you know, there, there's, it's not an issue, but, but, but where, but where are the other culinary traditions? You know, where, where are the Asian, you know, culinary traditions? You know, where are the African-American culinary traditions? And why aren't our culinary programs, you know, teaching to that? Our fashion programs and teaching, you know, the fashion of our different cultures, right? Mm -hmm. So ethnic studies just isn't about the Chicago Studies Department, Black Studies, Asian American Studies, Native American Studies. It's about the entire institution. Mm -hmm. Because if you want us to succeed, you know, what do you want us to succeed only by the rules that you give us? Or do you want us to succeed? And that may mean, you know, changing it up a bit. Let me give you an example. In, in where you went to school in Huntington Park, right? A, a, a lot of the markets couldn't survive. Vons, Safeway, uh, you know, Ralph, some of them are still around, right? But, you know, how did the Mexican markets of, of uh, Superior, El Super, Northgate, um, uh, what are the other ones, you know, they, they survived because a lot, of the, a lot of the mainstream supermarkets didn't think or care or about our communities. You know, so they're not going to have the, the, the products, the panes, the aguas, the, the all that, because, oh, we'll just call that the Hispanic section that they used to call it, right? Okay, well, we're like, fine, we'll create our own tortillerias in that case, if you don't want to service our... So just like the markets occurred, that's going to be happening more. Look, you can't, you can't get rid of our restaurants, our taqueros. If, if they could, they would, right? It's just everyone loves tacos, right? You can't get, you can't call it Hispanic tacos, you know, sold here, right? So, you know, so, you know, you have this world, you know, of these academics who are living in this world that really a lot of times aren't connected to the folks because a lot of times you live in the world of academia and they're like, well, we don't want to know about those Mexicans, even though you're, you got your job because of them. Even though that you know they advocated for you, but once you once you're up there in 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 the Ivy Tower, you know, well, I only represent you know Hispanics, and I'm like, all right, you know. <laughs> but until we actually demand, but I'll tell you, if you put pressure and demand, you will get what you want. Being quiet never got anyone anything. Yep. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. As, as speaking of connecting with folks, um, Gabriel, I'm going to start ending um, our, our lovely discussion tonight. Just for the record, so. it's not me ending. <laughs> Oh, you have more time? Okay. <laughs> no, tell my husband. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's the, you know, speaking of connecting with folks, you know, I, one of the things that really stood out to me was that you have a YouTube channel, you know, like I was like, what? Like, it's just really rare. And I'm telling you because one of the critiques that I've had of academia, of, of Chicano studies is the disconnect um, between Chicano studies educators uh, in academia and then the community is like no like there should be a present like there should be a bridge we should all know you know be involved in each other's uh, communities and be you know there should be some type of networking so anyway so the fact that you have a, a youtube channel which i will link abuelna uh, news um i wanted to talk about that you know what why did you create a youtube channel what what were you thinking what's the goal behind your youtube channel and you know because you're very specific as well as with the your guests that you have on there you've had artists you've had um authors you've had your brother who's a historian on there and you've you've interviewed um Dolores Dolores Huerta. Huerta. yeah I, I i love that interview um so it's like what what is behind it what is something that you hope to accomplish with your youtube channel critical race theory it, you know um and and I, I'm, I'm attempting to get people to um, have additional information so they could do what they're going to do with it. Everyone, including my own daughter, is saying, it's too long. They're too long. They're too long. You know, they're, 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 like, they're like, Papi, it's too long. My daughter's calling me Papi. Um, and, and I'm like, it's my thing, you know. I have zero ability to only talk for fifteen minutes. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, you know, but the re the th reason I I do them and they're a little longer, just like yours, because I'm doing them for the record, and I'm doing them, you know, someone is going to be sitting somewhere on a phone at an airport, and they've actually called me. Hey, I'm watching this video. I have a question on it, and I'm like, okay, what's your question? And because it's going to lead them to do something else, right? So my hope is that the videos will lead others to do other stuff, right? To take other actions at their schools, at their work site, at their what they're doing in life. So I am hoping that 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 punctuated equilibrium is coming. There, 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 there is there is how how it is how it how it will manifest itself, I do not know, but it is coming. So part of the discussions that I'm having on that show are, you know, to prepare for that agenda, you know, to prepare those who are watching to say, hey, it's kind of like, you know, we're going through this, you know, who's done this, you know, so they're watching your, your show, they, they, they link over to mine, and they're like, okay, well, okay, we, you know, I hate that, hate this, hate that. Okay, what's that one over there? <clears throat> and they pick up something and it's knowledge that they don't have to create from scratch. And it, maybe something I didn't say, maybe it was something you said, maybe something, you know, I interviewed Bernie Sanders is, um, you know, former campaign manager, you know, um, and, you know, there's a lot of people to interview, but a lot of folks don't have stuff that's interesting to, that I want to listen to. Right. So I've thought that some, you know, like um, Tony Cardenas, the the congressman his interview is fascinating he's one of the most aggressive you know that we have in congress you know um you know um father you know the interview i have with father boyle i've known father boyle forever in a day you know i wanted to push father Bo he baptized my three daughters too um and and uh, i worked together at at the loris mission with him you know um and maybe i should have challenged him a little more right in that conversation um you know, but I've learned from these conversations on how to challenge people more because if there is, if you're looking for the proportionality question, then you have to have these conversations. Um, and you and I, Sitalin, have to be ready to communicate with folks to say, hey, this is why we did this. 
Like you asked me, why did you do this nine years ago? Explain yourself, you know, and Fernando and I knew when we did that documentary that we were going to be accountable to folks in the future who are going to ask us why we did it. But you do not want to be in the future and say, what did you do? What did you do? Why weren't you prepared? Why weren't you prepared? You know, so look, our numbers are so bad. Our representation, so bad. Um, but our population number is growing so massively. And the other side, the right wing side that's anti CRT, critical race theory, they're getting violent. That means that, I mean, look, you know, I mean, you see violence growing on one side, you see another side with a lot of disequality. You know, what's going to happen right there? So I, I worry about that, you know, and I'm worried that a lot of our leadership in the organizations, elected officials, civil leaders aren't thinking about it. Some are, some are, but I'm not seeing sufficient in order to understand what our role is in that future growth. There will be a massive sprint forward. There will be. Will it be in one year? It, frankly, it could be in three months. It could be in three years. It could be in eight years. But it really takes people like you and the conversations that, that folks have in order to on whether that will occur or not. And what are we going to demand from the system? That's why I did outline Shakespeare, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that that was on the record and it doesn't have to be done anymore. You know, and one one of the the ending remarks, I'll say a few, and then I, I would like you to sure. to end the night. But I think the it's really powerful, and I would I, and I would argue that the punctuated equilibrium that you're talking about. First time I, I hear that that concept, but honestly, TikTok is showing me what is coming. The fact that I have my account for less than a month and I already have five thousand followers, it's to me speaks volumes of a wave that's coming. I've never received so much positive remarks and comments. I haven't received so many invites to podcast in the 24 years that I've been doing this until this last year and now. So there is something happening politically. There's mobilization, especially the youth that, are, that survived Trump. I see them. I see them politicized in ways that I could not have been. And I survived Prop 187. I survived um, the bilingual one, which was, um, is it 209? The, the two English seven. only? 227. You know, and it's like, I remember how that politicized me. And the, here I am, you know, and it's 24 years. And now looking at the youth that survive and are surviving all of these policies, Trump and all these other people. And so creating content like you are, creating documentaries like you did, I think it's, it's a way that we are telling our stories that are not being told, that are being overlooked, that are being minimized. And so I really respect and admire that you are creating content besides everything else that you're doing, being very intentional with social media because we know that at the end of the day, people are gonna be looking, are gonna be you know curious and, the fact that we have something to deliver, the fact that we have something prepared, cooking in the kitchen that's there for them to digest, however they're gonna digest it, like you said, agree with it or not, there's something there that they can actually hold and something tangible that they can actually um, you know, talk about, reflect on. Um, so that, that being said, Gabriel, I wanted you to kind of end the, the evening, if you will. You know, what would you say to students, first generation you know, college students, who are disempowered and feel that they're disempowered and are giving up on college and what for, I could just become a YouTuber. You know, like what, what's the value of education? What's the value of, of attending college? But not only that, but what is, how does that shape and what's the future for the Mexican experience for brown folks um, in this country? So, you know, if you're gonna put if you're gonna put part of this interview on TikTok, I would ask the question: What is Chicano punctuated equilibrianism? Um, you know, and 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 what that ultimately is is what is coming in order to move our numbers from the very low numbers in in in, in key sectors of the economy 
to somewhere where it's actually reasonable. And that punctuated equilibrianism, you know, Chicano, Brown, Mexican, you know, what, you know, what have you, punctuated equilibrialism means that it is a building up to that, right? It is, it is that energy that is built up because of the happening of different things. So if you are on TikTok and you're listening, Google it. You know, what is, you know, from a public policy perspective, and I'm a political scientist, what is punctuated equilibrianism versus incrementalism? Incrementalism is useless. <laughs> it is just, you're just replacing yourself. You know, ultimately, you know, we're headed to that. So how you implement that in your specific situation, you are, look, the Mendes family in Mendes versus Westminster, they were by themselves. No, there is no family in our history that has created more change for the United States. Well, I'm not going to say the entire United States. I'm going to say for Mexican Americans specifically, for people of color with regard to segregation, than the Mendes family and Mendes versus Westminster. Mendes led to, if, if without Mendes, the Brown case would have taken longer to occur. Let's be very, very, very clear with that. So people like the Mendez families, Jose and Felicitas Mendez, and their daughter, Sylvia, who's still with us, in the 1940s, they made a decision to be leaders, even when they were by themselves with all the other families in the Westminster area, you know, uh, over there partly where, where, you know, where, where you're at, to be leaders. And that means that you have to be a leader even when no one is watching. Because generations, to, first of all, you will not be able to live with yourself if you did not do something and you knew that you could and you chose not to. You know, so look, I, I, I've, I've chosen a, a path. I'm, I'm happy in choosing that, 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 that um, you know, that, that path. Um, and what was your, did I answer your last question or... Yeah, just what would you tell first generation students who are, are kind of oh, disillusioned? College. Yeah, okay. College. Okay. Um, you know, I graduated from high school with a 1.9 GPA. You know, and why do I admit that, right? I'm happy with that? No. Okay. Um, my, grad, my daughters each graduated with a 4.1, 4.2, um, you know, here from Sacred Heart here in, in Lincoln Heights, right? I, I tell my daughters, even if you doubled my GPA, it still wouldn't have gotten to your GPA. You know, but what generations are supposed to improve, right? So I tell my daughters, you are an improved version of your mother and I, um, is that should you go to college? 100%. And each one of you should go get a medical degree, get your law degree, and you have to prepare yourself in order to have a YouTube channel. Now, you could have your YouTube channel. I mean, you know, you, you know um, I mean, Citalin, you have your master's degree. You're going to go for your PhD. You know, I, I did an interview with the, the California group, the rappers. Well, guess what? They went, they have college degrees, you know. So, you know, um, Snow the, Snow the, um, the rapper? Wait, Snow, Snow the product. The, yeah, yes, Snow the product. <laughs> yeah, she's the, she's the, you know, she has a, I think she has a degree in social work as well. You know, so, you know, there's no leader in history you know, from Gandhi to King to uh, to Juarez, Benito Juarez to anyone who doesn't have a, 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 a law degree, a PhD, you know, because you're able to digest. It doesn't mean that, you, you know, you can, of course you can be a leader without it. Of course you can. But I'm saying that, that, that constant learning, constant learning, okay? And sometimes in it, as much as I kind of call myself a structured anarchist, you know, I, even though I believe in structures, right? I believe in challenging those structures on a regular basis. But you do need some place to learn, to question, to be somewhere, and to learn how to get things done, right? Um, how you choose that, how you learn that, that's up to you, right? But if, if anyone is saying that, you know, don't go to college, um, I, I'm not going to make the simple message, oh, you know, call, you know, go to college. Hey, no, I'm saying... College is for you. Let me just be very clear, right? <clears throat> College is for you. Whatever you decide to study there, <clears throat> it's on you. You know, again, 
I went Chicano Studies BA, Master's in Public Policy, Master's in Social, Social, Master's in Social Work, uh, uh, and then PhD Political Science and Law Degree. I went zigzag, zag, you know, around, right? Because I chose what I wanted to. No one told me what to do, right? Uh, um, you know, so choose what you want. You know, Citali, you might go because, get your culinary degree. That's your business, and I hope you do. You know, and that might fit with your history PhD, and you'll be able to do the history and power of food. You know, no one's going to tell me that the taquero hasn't changed the nature of politics in L.A., you know, with, with how many TikToks are there with learning how to, you know, eating outside and the, and the reverence for Al Pastor has never gotten, you know, so much respect, you know, than, than, our, than our TikTok. You know, uh, our, our taco, you know, our tacos are so, so good in L.A. now that Tijuana is changing their name to L.A. tacos, you know, instead of our, our, you know, Tijuana tacos. You know, when people, it's interesting on the Food Network one time, <clears throat> they were interviewing this, this woman from San Francisco. She said, what ta- um, uh, the interviewer said, what, what kind of Mexican food is this? And she said, San Francisco Mexican food. Wow. You know, and, 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 and I thought that was very powerful, very empowering. You know, we, you know, we, you know, it's interesting, like the De California hip hop group said, you know, a lot of Mexican hip hop is now coming from Chicano hip hop. You know, so, so, so we, we as Chicanos, Mexican Americans, whichever of the names you, you choose, and I really do mean that, whichever name, you know, because you've got Mexican, Mexican American, Chicano, you know, Chicana, Chicano, you know, so, you know, it's up to really you how, you know, how you choose it, but we are influencing Latin America as well. Selena influenced Latin America, yeah. you know, so we don't need to see ourselves as a spinoff of Mexico, you know, you know, you know, sometimes we know we could be, you know, we as Mexican Americans have as much economic power as the entire GDP of all of Mexico. Wow. You know, so, you know, so there, the relationship with Mexico is also going to be one that, that, that is going to have to change with regard to, to, to our influence in what's happening in Mexico. You know, how many of us here, my grandfather was, 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 was a lieutenant colonel in, in the Mexican military. Um, just to be very clear for those of out there, he fought on the rebel side during the Mexican Revolution. Just anyone who was going to question that, I've got my answer nicely prepared, all right? Um, my uncle, uh, you know, uh, Gena Rafael Buelna, you fly into Mazatlan, you fly into Rafael Buelna International Airport in Mazatlan. You know, so we are tied to a lot of these histories. You just can't say, oh, I'm born in LA. And no, you may be born wherever, but, but you know, um, or, or General Zaragoza, uh, Zaragoza, uh, in, in, in the Battle of Cinco de Mayo was, was a Tejano. He was born in, 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 you know, in Texas. You know, so, so you, know, you know, go to college. You have to go to college. I'm not going to say, oh, if you choose and you want to. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that one. You know, college is there. Go. Here at the LA Community Colleges, we fought to make it for, uh, for free. In fact, if you go to ELAC, you can go to the student services and get free vouchers for restaurants around ELAC, which it, it, uh, that's one of the programs I do have to say that I did help start, <clears throat> that we said to the restaurants, can you give meal vouchers? So do you know Mole La Tia? No. The restaurant right next to Liliana's um, Tamales, right there on Cesar Chavez. Right, so you could get a, a, a 199 breakfast there if you say you're an ELAC student, you know. So, so you can get free tuition, free wow. books, and almost free food. We're not at the housing yet. So, my job is to make sure that you can get that stuff for free. Your job is to get it, finish it, implement it, help people, you know. So, that's why, you know, I'm not patient with folks that say, well, you know, tal vez el colegio no es para toda la comunidad. I'm like, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's the end of it. I said that 20 years ago, and I'm still right today. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. You know, it's been one an final amazing. plug. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, of course. Um, if you, if you, if you want to reach me, um, would call, go to my website, um, Buena Law. Uh, doc, well, visit the YouTube. Okay, visit the YouTube site, Buena News. Press subscribe, like right there. Okay, do us that favor. 
Um, thank you. Share all the videos, especially this one today. Also, visit Mexican Excellence. Press subscribe right there, okay? <laughs> Both Itali and I, and I, you know, we all, that's kind of like the duty of us all. But um, if you want to speak with me as an individual, go to Buena Law. I'm barely putting up the website, but it has my email right there. And I'll get back to you whether you need to speak with me on a topic that related here or something related to the law. Um, you know, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you for that, Gabriel. And for our viewers, I want you to know that his article, the documentary, um, the articles, and links to the videos that we reference in this talk will be linked in the video description. So please make sure to subscribe to his channel, follow his work. He's not just on there. He's actually writing articles. He's very active. So please stay thank up you. in contact with Gabriel. And Gabriel, again, thank you for sharing space with me tonight, for having this much needed conversation on the much needed topics for our community. I hope to have you back again and again and again. There's a lot more that we didn't get to, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you the list later. But it's so important, like you said, for us to, to have these conversations, to cross, you know, to reach out to each other and to build community because this is the time that we have to do it. This is the moment. And I really hope that people, you know, hear what you had to say historically, as far as the law, as far as education, everything that you shared with us has been super helpful, super eye-opening. And I hope that people continue to, to get your content with your interviews, um, especially the one that I watched last was the Chicano communist. I mean, oh. that was an amazing interview. So yes, um, there's so much more to learn about our history and our culture. So make sure to subscribe, follow his work. He's also on TikTok too. He created a TikTok account. So you'll see some, some, some bites I'm of, learning on, that, yeah. <laughs> on his work on there. So until next time, thank you, Gabriel, once again. Thank you okay. to your family for allowing you to be up late in this conversation um, and get rest. You, uh, you have a lot of work to do and so do thank we. You. So thank you, everybody. Right. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.